Hello, people of Earth. How are you getting on? It's Matt Thomas here, back upon the Sonic to talk about cloning hardware. A kind of cloning that we can all get involved with. No ethical issues because everyone wants more hardware. Da -da, and now we can have it. How's that, Matt? How do I get more hardware? Well, that's what we're going to discover today. Why would you want more hardware? If, like me, you're a horrific gear hound, it's because you keep buying stuff and buying stuff and buying stuff. At some point, either due to financial necessity or the threat of divorce, you will have to let some of this gear go. But how do I keep the sounds, Matt? Hardware cloning. Ooh, but what if I'm not an insane gear hound? What if I just have a really great reverb and I want to use more than one of them without buying more than one of them? Hardware cloning. <gasps> There's an answer, Matt. There is. And if you stick with me for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you how to do it. So in order to clone a piece of hardware, what we're going to need is a piece of hardware. Da -da. And we're going to need something called a deconvolution plugin, which obviously sounds all kinds of fun. Now I'm going to use the one in Ableton and in Ableton it's called the IR measurement device. Now, unfortunately it's only in the Ableton suite version. If you're not running that, then you're going to need an alternative, but there are alternatives. Logic has something similar in its space designer plugin. There's standalone stuff from Vox and Go called the Deconvolver. There's other stuff I'll have a hunt around and find you a bunch. And as I'm saying this, it'll be appearing in front of you. Ah, the magic of editing. So yeah, there's options, that's covered. What I'm gonna do is show you what the basic idea is now. And then with this nice piece of fat hardware, we'll get a bunch of IRs. I can then sell this, spend the money and buy another piece of random rubbish. I can clone that and so on and so on. And you can do the same. IR measurement device is our boys get things started. Let's stick it on channel three. There we go, as I think. And there it is. Nice and straightforward little thing. We've basically got about four or five sort of choices to make before we start recording our IR. Now, what is an IR before I leap straight in? It's called an impulse response. And the name kind of tells you what it is. There's an impulse, it can be a clap or a firing pistol, or in this case, it can be an electronic sweep or a burst of noise. So there's a kind of a bang, and then there's the echo, which we call the response. So what we're doing is we're sending in a sort of test signal and we're seeing how this piece of hardware here responds. And we're going to record the response as a kind of a map for how a convolution reverb could recreate this sound. Now, what's a convolution reverb? I'm assuming you've bumped into them. If not, it's quite straightforward. There's two main kinds of reverb that we get inside a computer these days. There is the algorithmic type where an algorithm works out how a reverb might sound, a sort of mathematical modeling process. And then it's convolution, which is recordings of real spaces, be it cathedrals, tin pans, anything. And those are then sort of sampled into a convolution fingerprint, as it were, which we can feed sounds through. And that's what we're doing here. We're making a convolution recording of this piece of hardware. And once we've got that, whenever I send sound through that convolution reverb with this loaded into it, it'll recreate this sound. So how do we do it? First thing is channels, true stereo. Yes, indeed. This is a true stereo device. It has a left and a right in as well as a left and a right out. True stereo means it has an input with left and right. Most things have got left and right output, but if you've only got a single input, switch this to mono to stereo. This has got left and right. I'll leave it there. Amp, how loud is the trigger signal? I have found that this is quite a sensitive piece of gear, so I'm going to put it down quite low, minus 30. That simply means how loud is the sound we're about to play through this piece of equipment. Sweep. Two ways of doing this. We can either do what's called a sweep or an impulse. An impulse doesn't do a sweep. As you can see, it just fires off a quick sound. A sweep is a much slower rise from the very bottom of the frequencies right through to the top. Which one is best is kind of a decision that depends on the piece of kit and you'll only find out by running both. If you can run a sweep, you've got the time you're not in a hurry and it works fine it's probably slightly better because it runs every frequency in turn and sees how they respond in the piece of equipment or in the room you're sampling with the impulse you basically get a very fast kind of clip of white noise and it just sees how that acts across all the frequencies at once they both work absolutely fine however the sweep tends to be the one people go for if they have got the leisure so the length of the sweep the longer the sweep is, it's just literally how long is it going to take to go from subsonic to hypersonic. So 10 seconds, nice and quick. Or do you want it to take absolutely ages, in which case you'll get an even higher quality IR. So let's compromise on 45, high quality. And the IR time itself, how many seconds 
is the sound you're trying to record. So if I'm in a big echoey St. Paul's Cathedral kind of vibe and I click my fingers, it's going to go maybe four or five seconds, I don't know, maybe longer. If I go under my stairs in my house and click my fingers, it's going to be about a third of a second, if that little dead quiet room. Now this piece of kit here has maybe like a second, maybe two at most. I mean, I would say a second's going to cover it, but let's do two just in case. If it's too long, you've just got some dead air at the end of your impulse. So that is now set up, ready for us to send sounds through this nice piece of Sony kit here. What makes this nice? Should we hear it before we sample it? Yeah, go on, let's. So I've got a, a beat here. Okay, a little percussion loop there, right? What I will do is I'll play that and I'll send the percussion loop into this and then I'll set the sound to where I want it because obviously you get your sound right before you do it once you record it, like any sample. A sample is a sample. We can't sort of change the settings afterwards. So I'm gonna get the settings right. Once I'm happy with it, we'll then sample this. Okay, so let's get the drum beat going. Okay, so now I am going to send that into the Sony. Okay, nice. Now you might be wondering, what is that Sony doing? What is it? This is basically about the rarest studio effect on the planet, really. Before there were analog delays, digital delays, after there were tape delays, for about a year there were these. Now what this is, is an acoustic pipe delay. What it's doing is, unbelievably, inside this box here is 15 meters of hose. And that's not even the main thing this box does. The main thing this box does is it's actually a Sony quadraphonic amp. In the early 70s, there was a brief moment where people were saying, you know what, stereo is not enough. We all need to have four speakers just to listen to music. So for a brief while, some famous albums like Dark Side of the Moon and stuff were mixed in quad. And so this is an amp for you to play quad back again. Now, if you had a stereo record and you thought, oh, my speakers at the back aren't doing much, what Sony thought was, aha, if we had a way of making like a slightly delayed copy of what's happening at the front, but not just the same, otherwise it'll kind of phase then that would create like a sort of like a fake quad effect where we've got the record at the front and a sort of depth behind you. And so the way they dealt with that was to basically use acoustics. Sound moves at a certain speed, it's not instant, it kind of feels like an instant. Like with thunder, the whole thing of counting, you see the lightning flash and then you count for the thunder, yeah? That is the sound travelling from the lightning to you, yeah? So by putting 15 metres of pipe inside this thing, Although that's not a huge distance, it is some distance. So they put a speaker at one end and then microphones at one, two, three positions along it. And what those equated to is 15 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds and 45 milliseconds. You can see on the panel there above them. And these are level controls for each one of the microphones. So I can sort of mix however I want this combination of three different very short delays to play together. I think there's a little bit of feedback in there somewhere as well. It seems to echo slightly longer than that. It's not just a slap. There seems to be a tiny bit of like resonant feedback. So that's what we're hearing, okay? Now, if I change the level... See, so I can mix this around, get different degrees of tone. And as well as these delays, I've also got like an EQ going into them so I can actually kind of drive the signal that's sending into this delay with more top or more bass. And more level. Okay, so that's gone from being, let's just hear it and dry again. So we got like a percussive loop. And that's kind of turned into a piece of metallic techno. So I like that, but I'm not keeping this because lovely as it is, I'm not going to use it that often, but I do want to keep that sound. How do we do it? Okay, so we've set that up properly. Come back to our impulse response measurement device. Okay, I have sent the output of my desk into that Sony. So I'm going to, on this channel here, that's going to do the impulse response measurement. I go external out, 
And yes, I want external out one, two to come out of here. This is going to make a test tone. Okay. And it's going to send it into the desk. Yeah. And the desk is then going to, with a bit of auxiliary sending, put it into the, the Sony here. And the Sony is then going to come back out on three and four. Okay. And once you select your inputs and your outputs, don't forget to put the monitor in. Okay. See the microphone appears, it means this is now ready to record. If you leave it there, it's not recording, okay? So quite important, stick it on in, otherwise this is all just gonna hear silence. Not so much use. And so now we've got it all set up, 45 seconds, we're gonna make a two second IR of that. I'm gonna hit sweep now, and you're gonna hear it will, from a very, very deep, you know, subsonic, we can't hear it position right through above where we can hear it. It's gonna sweep up, and because we're doing true stereo, it's gonna do it twice, once on the left channel, once on the right. Here we go. You can see straight away, although we can't hear it unless you've got very, very deep monitoring. Oh, there you go, just coming into my headphones now. So it's a subsonic sweep going all the way up to hypersonic at the top. As requested, it's at minus 30 dB, see there it is. And that's gonna take 45 seconds to sweep all the way from the bottom of the audio range to the top. It's gonna to do it, first of all, with just, as you can see here, just the left channel. Then it repeats it with just the right channel, okay? Now, yes, you can probably hear it in both ears because we're hearing both the sweep and the Sony TA2244 responding to it. And so, of course, it's making that delayed echoey sound in stereo. Okay, so for me personally, with my absolutely wrecked hearing, there we go, that was the, uh, the last five seconds was completely silent anyway. So now, here we go, back in the bass end. Oh, oh there it is. Oh, oh, here we go. Okay, this is going to carry on through. And once it does that, it's going to trim and normalize it because I've set that here, which means basically it will just cut off any dead sound and it will normalize the recording to a decent level. When that is done, we're simply going to save it. You can audition what you've done, but I find this just a fiddly waste of time. It's much quicker just to save it and then drag it into a convolution reverb and test it. Apologies to any back keepers. Okay, that's done. Measurement done. So I hit save. And I'm going to call this Sony TA2244. Uh, everything's kind of on full, full, and treble boost. Okay, so I save that. Ta -da. And now over here on channel four, the old Akeem groove. Let's stick a hybrid reverb and test it out. Why the hybrid reverb? Because it is two reverbs in one. It lets you use a convolution and an algorithmic in the same reverb and mix between the two set of blend. Now, we do not need to use the algorithmic here. We're just using this to host our convolution reverb recording of the Sony. So I can just turn that off by saying, just convolution, please. All that grays out. None of that's now affecting the sound, just the IRs here, okay? So I can load it in quite simply by clicking into my IR folder and just dropping onto there. Da -da, there it is. You can see there, there's the spikes of the kind of the 15, the 30, the 45 millisecond delay echoing off there. Okay, so first things first, let's see how that sounds. Now, before we do this, I'm just going to mute this, run the Akin. And now I've muted the actual piece of Sony hardware, yeah, because that was still on the desk making all that sound. So we've just got dry Akeem. Okay, and if I now turn on the reverb. Ta -da, there we go. There you go. So we've recreated the sound of that Sony with that IR. Now, I can, which is quite fun, mess with this IR in a way I couldn't with the real thing. For example, I can shorten the decay, make it really brief. So we get the same sound, but without any ringing in it. If I make the decay longer, than the IR, which is, we recorded two seconds, didn't we? Then 
there is no effect. It's only bringing it down shorter, okay? What you can also do is change the size, which is like playing a sample up or down the keyboard, yeah, like just pitches higher and lower. Which in the case of this quite sort of tonal resonant thing means I can actually tune this into a track or use it. as a kind of builder. We can also, with this particular one, and not all convolution hosts will do this, but this one we can even make a feedback loop, which for this particular sound is kind of fantastic because I know exactly what milliseconds the lengths of these little short delays are. Basically, the units are 15 milliseconds on this. If I put in 15 and feed that back, make sure this is back on its original size, then what happens is I can make that metallic effect even longer. So when I say you can't really edit your IRs, you can't, but you still can do a lot with them. So it's important you capture a few of these covering the various things this machine can do, because once you've sold it, it's gone. As I say, if you're keeping it, don't worry about it. Just take the sample you need as you need it, and you can keep making new ones whenever you want to. Stick them in a folder, save them all means you know you've got all these things ready to go as and when what are the limitations well you can't really do distortion it doesn't like distortion if you clip it it's not going to be happy it's going to make an ugly clip if you try and get sort of nice sexy saturation it doesn't really understand that similarly with pitch shifting doesn't really follow the relationship between the sound you put in and the one that comes out it just won't really do that very well things that can do that they do exist there's a a company called Acoustica used to make a thing called Nebula. They've got various other products now, but essentially all the same basic idea that they're now moving into kind of AI modeling. They can model dynamic changing things, stuff which overloads and distorts as you put louder and louder sounds to it. They can sort of model that stuff. So you can put a compressor into their system. You can put a saturation into their system. We could look at that. If you guys are interested, you need to comment below and say, yes, show us how art is done and we will do that. But when you're using convolution, you can basically do things like reverbs, delays, but you can't change the delay time. Okay, so this, which having its kind of fixed delays is very suitable. Some tape delays like the, uh, the Watkins copycat. It's also, say for example, you wanted to record a speaker, like the sound of a particular guitar cab, or if I wanted to record the tone of this EQ, it'll work for that. If I turn the delay off, turn this treble, if I think, you know what, I think that Sony's got a beautiful treble. I can just basically dry all the delay out, just turn the treble up, and I can save an IR, which just recreates the sound of that treble boosted. Now, it won't be like a, a treble I can turn up and down, it'll be boosted to whatever setting I set it. So I put it there, take a shot, there, take a shot, there, take a shot. And then I've got three settings of that Sony's treble turned up. And I could even put the treble model on the screen in another hybrid reverb before the pipe delay. And then I've kind of created an even better Sony, haven't I? So that's the kind of stuff you can get into. I hope this has given you some ideas and I will see you back upon the Sonic sooner than you know. It.